Chapter 30, Multisystem Trauma. So there's a reason that trauma is one of the most difficult concepts when it comes to exams. Uh, this topic is missed more frequently than just about any other uh, area of the discipline. And the reason being is because we have the potential for this multi-system trauma. And we've spent time talking about uh, chest-specific injuries. You know, what does a pneumothorax look like? How does it present? You know, what, what, should it, uh, what should we be looking for? How should we treat it? Uh, conversely, what does a closed head injury look like? How does that present and how should we treat it? Uh, what about a compound fracture of the femur? How do we address that? Um, and individually, it's easy to look at specific injuries, identify their presentations, and discuss treatment plans. But what happens when you have a patient that has a closed head injury, a pneumothorax, and a compound fracture of their femur? How do we address that? And that's what this chapter is really looking at. Um, not so much on, on how do we fix any of these specific injuries, but how is it that we identify the severity of a multi-system patient? How do we determine which injuries are the most um, uh, severe comparatively? And what should we do in regards to overall treatment for these patients? So with multi-system trauma itself, um, the multi-system trauma patient just simply means that they have multiple injuries, right? There's, there's nothing more to it than that. Um, the concept there is the fact that you know we have multiple systems that may be affected such as the circulatory system or the respiratory system we could have the the gi system involved um, there, there's so many different systems that that play into it that uh, any one of those sim, uh, systems alone can present challenges when the body tries to go into that that protective mode or that response measure um, but when we have multiple systems involved, now the body's typical, you know, un underlying or natural responses to injury, all of those are impeded significantly. So again, it not only makes the treatment difficult, but now the body has a hard time trying to fix itself as well. So we have to be able to make some very critical decisions here, right? Is this patient a priority? Um, you know, overall, what is their severity? Uh, what hospital do they need to go to? You know, was it a level one, level two patient? Um, whether or not to limit scene time is, is huge. And there are times that you are going to have a, a patient that simply cannot be treated by an EMT or a paramedic. The only thing that's going to save that patient's life is going to be a surgeon. And we need to be able to quickly identify those patients and that's it, we're done, we're out. Throw them on a backboard, get them in the back of your ambulance and every single thing should be done driving. You know, my record scene times for, for those true critical patients, the ones that, of course, aren't entrapped or anything, is I can have a scene time of less than two minutes. And it is literally jumping out of the ambulance. You can see from the windshield that this patient is beyond help pre-hospital. They need surgery. And we jump out of the, the ambulance, somebody grabs C-spine, we put a backboard down, we do a, a quick 30-second scan of the body just to make sure we don't see anything, you know, really sticking out that, that's terrible. Put them on the backboard in the ambulance, and bam, we're off and run into the hospital. And although that seems quick and hasty, you know, the, the idea there is that the longer every second that they remain on scene is one more second further from life, right? Or in this case, one, one second closer to death. So every second we can shave off there is going to give them the, the best chances of survival. Um, how do we determine severity? You know, beyond looking at individual in, uh, injuries, we're going to look at overall uh, mental status, their, their glass calcoma score. And it says here anything less than 14. And, you know, that's important because it, we could have a GCS of 14 from a basic uh, concussion or something, right? And that's, that's truly not going to be life-threatening. But if you have a patient that is, is truly confused, if they're, they're mumbling, they're not talking appropriately, um, if they have a, a hard time with motor function, you know, their eyes aren't responding appropriately, any of these things, you know, these are all clues that say, hey, this is a really bad patient. Uh, so any type of GCS under 14 is going to be uh, really a, a big indicator that this should be critical time sensitive patient. Hypotension, suggesting that they're hemodynamically unstable, right? If they have a systolic pressure less, less than 90, uh, that is not normal. And we have to assume, especially in the trauma patient, that there's some type of shock going on there. Um, more than likely, it could be a, a hemorrhagic shock from some type of bleeding, uh, but there's the potential for neurogenic shock or any other issues as well. Their abnormally slow respiratory rate, especially with an adult, if they are compensating, their respiratory rate should be elevated. When you start to see their respiratory rate drop down, 
that should suggest to you that they have some type of either uh, significant respiratory impairment or a significant closed head injury, remembering that the, the brain, specifically the medulla oblongata, is what controls respiratory function. Anytime we have penetrating injuries, you know, we, we get concerned about those. Anything more than somebody who gets stabbed by a pen or something else, you know, those, uh, any knife, any gunshot wound, uh, or worse, these are all things that are going to pose significant injuries. We don't know what type of internal damage is being done. And again, these are patients that can only be fixed uh, in the hospital by a surgeon. Any type of significant anatomical damage, uh, says here, you know, degloving or being mangled, you know, those things are important. Uh, whether or not it is truly a life threat is, is not what we're looking at there. You know, the big question is, what is their quality of life going to be? And, you know, considering, assuming that you have full function of all, all 10 fingers and uh, all 10 toes, that, you know, your hands, your feet, you have full motor function, think, have you ever thought about, you know, just how um, valuable that is and how much we probably take it for granted? And if, you know, somebody goes in, and loses use of a hand or a foot or or an arm or or whatever you know that's going to be pretty significant as far as uh, their overall lifestyle goes so if we can preserve quality of life for them if we can minimize the uh, impact to their overall lifestyle that's equally important um, mechanism of injury sometimes will be the only clue that we have in determining whether or not a patient is critical um, you know if we have a uh, collision, a front-end collision at, let's say, 100 miles per hour, I think it stands to say that that's going to be a pretty high high mechanism of injury with a huge injury potential. But also consider, what if what if we have two vehicles that collide head-on, each of them traveling 50 miles per hour? And that's any country road, right? That collision right there, that is the equivalent to a 100-mile-per-hour collision. So these things should be identified, and we should say, hey, there's, there's high potential for injury here. Even if the airbag is deployed and they were wearing their seatbelt, there's still the huge potential for internal injury that those safety devices can't really protect against. You know, determining the, the height of the fall, what they fell onto, uh, if there was a, a vehicle collision, how much intrusion into the vehicle, whether or not they, re, they were ejected. You know, really, these things are all stuff that we, we discussed during the scene size up chapter as we looked at mechanism of injury. So if we have somebody who meets one of these criteria, um, we should consider this a high likelihood for a multi-system trauma and the fact that we should get them rapidly to a trauma center. Adults, specifically older adults or elderly patients, can present a challenge in the fact that they're unable to localize pain as well. Um, diabetics and elderly patients as a whole, uh, they lose overall sensitivity and function of the central nervous system. And as a result of that, the peripheral nervous system is also impeded. Therefore, it's difficult for them to localize specifically, you know, where pain is at or even to identify the presence of pain at all. Kids are especially difficult as well. Um, you know, they, first of all, are, they're unique individuals, right? We, we treat them differently than we do adults in many cases. They need to go to pediatric specialty centers. You know, a general surgeon may be great at dealing with adults, but usually we have specialists that deal with, uh, with pediatrics. So um, any level one trauma criteria, uh, for a child, it may not be necessarily the, the closest level one trauma center. You know, they may be flying into a, a, a hospital that has pediatric capabilities. So these are all things, again, to, to keep in mind. Um, if they're on blood thinners or if they're pregnant, all of that plays into it as well. What's up, big guy? So let's talk a little bit about how we're going to manage the multi-system trauma patient. And really, it doesn't vary a whole lot from how we would handle any uh, isolated trauma, uh, but something to keep in mind. You know, these patients are going to be resource dependent, meaning that we're going to need to utilize multiple responders, multiple EMS personnel to truly mitigate and treat these patients. Therefore, we should practice with our crews. How are we going to do this, right? And it's easy enough to talk about it, but when you actually get into the back of the ambulance, you know, you have limited space to move around. Uh, you can't move from the front of the ambulance to the back or vice versa without stepping on people. So how are you going to split up these tasks and resources? Um, and when we talk about doing a rapid head to toe in the classroom, we're going to practice by, um, you know, having somebody start at the head and they work systematically down the body and we're good to go. But in truth, we're not able to do that in the ambulance. You may have to assign a head to pelvis exam to 
responder A, and then a pelvis to foot exam to responder B. So there's, again, just a lot of uh, logistical challenges when we go to deal with these patients. And these are things that we shouldn't be learning as we go. Uh, we should be practicing and thinking about how we would divvy up these responsibilities and roles prior to the call coming out. Uh, frequently, I'll talk to my partner, or if I have a, a cadet or a, a student in the back, I'll yell back to them, hey, you know, here's what I'm thinking when we get there. And what I don't do is truly pre-plan everything. I don't think it's appropriate to do that uh, because every situation is unique and dynamic when you get there and you have to be able to kind of modify things. So if you permanently assign a role and people have it in the mind that that's what they're going to do no matter what when they get there, uh, a lot of times it causes us to miss some of the more important things. So we'll talk about concepts, about uh, maybe different types of priorities, but I will never specifically say you will do this when we get there. Uh, I, again, I don't think that that's appropriate. Scene safety, we've, we've beat that like a dead horse th uh, throughout the entire semester. If you don't have that down yet, well, then we need to have a conversation. Uh, we're still not going to deviate, though, from the, uh, from the assessment algorithm. Right? We're still going to do a scene size up. We're going to follow that with a primary assessment. We're going to roll from there into a secondary assessment, and we're going to continue to reassess our patient. So do not allow the severity of this patient to cause you to deviate from that that algorithm. You know, I told you that we need to be unique and dynamic when we get there, and that's fine, but we still need to have some element of structure, and that structure comes from that assessment algorithm. Um, when we're talking about the call itself, uh, we're still going to kind of be bound by identifying priorities and going from there. The difference here is that these patients, we may not have time to do everything. You know, if I have a patient that has a life-threatening hemorrhage, uh, they have signs of a closed head injury, and that closed head injury is affecting their respiratory ability, well, I'm not going to have time maybe even to do a set of vitals. And quite frankly, why do I care? You know, if they're not breathing effectively, and I have to assign somebody to breathe for them, to ventilate them, meanwhile, somebody else is working on, on holding direct pressure on a life-threatening hemorrhage, then... You know, who's left to take vitals? And if that's where it comes down to the number of resources that are available, the number of personnel. And just because in a, in a scenario in class we say, oh, I'd like to have additional resources, that doesn't always mean that they're going to be there. And in reality, they're not. You know, we, we are all, all of these fire departments and EMS agencies around here, we're running low. We're running short on people. There just aren't that many people available anymore. We struggle to meet our staffing needs, and all of our call volumes are up. So there's a high likelihood that it may just be you or, if you're lucky, one other person that's working this multi-system trauma. So don't get spoiled thinking that you're always going to be able to delegate. Sometimes we're going to have to prioritize. What interventions, what procedures are the most important, will have the best impact on my patient, and which ones are my maybe going to need to skip over. Um, so as we work through that then, we need to be sure that, again, we attend to the immediate threats, and we do need to give the hospital a phone call. Now, that's probably one of the toughest things to find time to do when we're, you know, working with these patients. You know, it, it takes a, a couple minutes to get the hospital on the line and to give them a report, and when we are resource depleted and we don't have enough hands to perform all the tasks that need to be performed, it seems as though calling the hospital should be the last on our priority list. And although that you know, it, it is certainly lower on the list than a, a life-threatening intervention would be. Um, it is equally important to give the hospital that notification to, to call them up in advance. Uh, they need to be prepared. And as you roll through the door, the last thing you want is for them to not have a room ready for you, for the uh, for respiratory or pharmacy not to be there ready to go, for them not to have an airway, uh, airway cart ready to intubate the patient, uh, and whatever else the case may be. And it's perfectly acceptable when you call the hospital to simply say, hey, you know, this is Scott. I'm inbound with a 37-year-old uh, male patient, uh, critical trauma uh, resulting from a, a car accident. Uh, I don't have a lot, uh, lot for you right now, but this is a multi-system trauma. We'll be there in about five minutes and uh, be advised that he's losing a lot of blood. You know, that could be your entire report. And in, in saying that, that tells them a, a lot. One, that they're going to need all the resources in the hospital available, ready to go. They're going to free up the CT table. Uh, they're going to bring x-ray down to the, the trauma room. 
They're going to have the trauma room itself prepped. They're going to allocate multiple nurses and at least a doctor or two to that room. They're going to have blood products on standby. So when you roll through the door, if they need to start doing blood um, infusions, they can. Uh, all these things are uh, ways for them to be prepared. And at the end of the day, that 30 seconds that you just spent calling them is going to save potentially five or 10 or more minutes of time when the patient gets to the hospital. So an early call to the hospital is definitely going to be a, an important intervention in regards to patient care. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about either postponing or even maybe eliminating vital signs if need be. And remember that when you do vital signs, that doesn't mean you always have to do a complete set of vital signs. You know, uh, vital signs may include just simply checking a radial pulse or assessing respiratory rate. I can tell you right now that on my critical patients, uh, I don't get a blood pressure on every single set of vitals. Uh, unless I've got them hooked up to my monitor and it's an automatic blood pressure, I can tell you that the blood pressure I get to maybe two or three times because it's more time consuming. Uh, other than that, though, assessing a radial pulse as far as the strength and regularity goes, those are probably the most important things that I can do because that tells me a lot about overall perfusion status without having to take an actual blood pressure. The amount of uh, treatment that we do on scene is going to be dependent on, on what's truly critical for that patient, what's going to be life-saving, life uh, and what can be delayed. And in many situations, the splinting and everything else, the bandaging, that's all stuff that can be done en route to the hospital or even at the hospital in the worst of circumstances. Uh, our focus should always be on maintaining that airway, ensuring adequate oxygenation, and trying to stop any life-threatening hemorrhage. Oh, look, there's scene safety again. I think you guys have that down, right? Uh, so trauma scoring is one other thing that you can do. And uh, trauma scoring, similar to the Glasgow Coma Score, is something that allows us to kind of look at the, um, the general severity of the patient from an objective numerical system. And uh, it factors in their Glasgow Coma Score itself. And then it also puts in uh, systolic blood pressure and respiratory rate. And altogether, we get what's called this revised trauma score, or, or uh, RTS. And uh, from there, then we can trend that, right? The patient's RTS was initially X, and now it is Y, right? And uh, we can see whether or not they improved or declined, whether or not they're remaining the same, et cetera. We don't use this too often, I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's something that usually requires us to kind of get the book out, take a look at, and do the math. And on the patients who are truly deserving of a revised trauma score, those are the ones that we probably don't have the time to be doing the, the score itself. Uh, so if you do have the, the time to do it or the resources, by all means, it's a good tool to use. Uh, but this should not be high on your priority list whatsoever. And that really kind of wraps it up for this chapter. There isn't a lot to it. A few videos at the end that you can watch online on, on my Brady Lab if you'd like to. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, the big takeaways for this chapter is just simply that these patients are going to be complex. They're going to have multiple injuries that kind of present um, and that may conflict with each other, right? So we may uh, expect to see tachycardia when in fact we see bradycardia just because we have two different injury presentations uh, kind of going up against each other head to head. Uh, these patients are going to be uh, time sensitive. We're going to have to prioritize what tasks we perform. We need to minimize our scene time. We need to identify the appropriate uh, hospital or, or destination. And we have to learn how to effectively manage our resources to make sure that we can do as much as we can with as little as we can. And that's, again, really it. Uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed it and appreciate your time. And we'll see you in class. You're making noise back there. <laughs>